try to get it actually adopted. But our, our secret weapon truly is Senator Bob Menendez. Um, there has been truly in, in, in our decades of work, I can't imagine anybody who has been more effective, more productive than Senator Menendez. We've had some great ones over the years, Senator Paul Sarbanes, and Senator John Sarbanes now, and Gus Bilarakis, and the Greek American, they fought very hard for issues. But uh, the way Bob Menendez has, particularly as chairman and now as ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, made Cyprus and Greece a priority in very substantive ways is truly remarkable. And it's one thing to introduce legislation and get co-sponsors, but another thing to find a way to get it adopted and legislation is moving to the Senate as he did. In this end of the year legislation uh, to determine the, the, the funding for the country, he was able to get this legislation in there and the wording in there and therefore adopted and signed into law. Um, without Bob, I don't know where we'd be. So he's a, a true gift to our community. But it, it's, it's now, as, as you probably saw, that legislation, just for those that are unfamiliar with it, the key elements of that, well, first of all, Menendez said when it was passed that, and I think this is a good summary, that this legislation marks the dawn of a new day for the United States engagement in the Eastern Mediterranean, bolstered by strong and expanding relationships with Greece, Israel, and Cyprus. This legislation will significantly strengthen our joint efforts to promote peace, prosperity, and security. Um, what the legislation does, the, the top four or five things is it lifts the prohibition on the arms sales of the Republic of Cyprus. It authorizes the establishment of the United States Eastern Mediterranean Energy Center to facilitate energy cooperation between the US, Israel, Greece, and Cyprus. It authorizes foreign military financing for Greece. It authorizes international military education and training or IMET assistance for Greece and for Cyprus. And requires, and this is important, requires the administration to submit to Congress a strategy on enhanced security and energy cooperation with the countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as reports on malign activities by Russia and other countries in the region. So this forces the administration to think through more carefully ways the United States can be helpful in fostering that uh, relationship between the three slash four countries. Another thing we've been working on that hasn't gotten that kind of attention is trying to, through the appropriations process, develop a uh, strengthening or a, um, a, a, a way to, a, a, let, me, let me back up a little bit, and that's why I'm starting to, to hesitate here. While things are really bad with Turkey right now, as time has shown, things will get better, whether there's a new leader in Turkey or whether Erdogan finds a way to control himself a little more, things between the United States and Turkey will get better. When they do, we can't have this current it tends to focus on U.S. Greece and U.S. Cyprus relations die down as a result. So we're trying to find ways to formalize this relationship with the Eastern Mediterranean Partnership. So we're trying to create funding to allow for, as we were able to get in the appropriations legislation last year through Congresswoman Nita Lowy, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, an annual summit uh, between Greece, Cy that would bring over the United States, the ministers, uh, of, of defense, foreign affairs, and energy from Greece, Cyprus, and Israel to further explore strengthening the relationship between these four countries and those areas. So there's a lot going on in the Congress to try to, again, formalize and strengthen uh, these relationships because in the end, um, we need this kind of foundation for, again, when things get better with Turkey, um, we need reminders of the United States and why Greece and Cyprus matter to the United States. Mm -hmm. um I know you have a close relationship with Senator Menendez. What would you say motivates his, this Phil Hellenism he, he seems to have and his commitment to, to Hellenism? Well, I'd love to tell the story about how it started because it shows that one person can make a difference, um, whether in our issues or in government in general. And there was a member of Congress, Bob Menendez in New Jersey, and one of his constituents, is a Cypriot American, Ta uh, Tasso Zambas. And Tasso, as anybody who knows Tasso, is a very spirited, passionate person, particularly about the Cyprus issue. And Tasso Zambas, as the story goes, went up to Bob Menendez's house and knocked on his door and said, my name is Tasso Zambas, I'm a neighbor, I'm a constituent, and I want to talk to you about the Cyprus issue. Well, Tasso is also a, um, one of the nicest people I ever meet and hit it off with Bob. They became close personal friends and he's kept the senator educated, engaged, 
The senator also is uh, of Cuban background, and there are a lot of similarities between the Cuban American community's experience and the Cyprus American community's experience. And so um, it is uh, that kind of thing that started it, but Bob Menendez is this lethal combination of intelligence and, and, and passion for the issues he, he works on and believes in. And um, he is a tough son of a gun. It's great to have him <laughs> on your team. I wouldn't want to be on the other side, uh, but he's uh, very well respected on both sides of the aisle. Um, mm -hmm. And we couldn't have a better advocate. So it, I think all those factors combined. And then, you know, the national community has really been there for him. He's had some, uh, some tough reelections, particularly the most recent one. And the community really jumped in and did all they could to try to help work towards his reelection. So mm -hmm. I think he appreciates that as well. And um, God, I, I hope he doesn't go anywhere anytime soon. I think it's important to, for all of us to recognize the, the importance of engaging with our members of Congress, engaging with our representatives. I think it has become increasingly, um, we, we have become increasingly pessimistic or cynical about our ability to affect change. And it's important to remember that our representatives are literally our representatives. And if we don't reach out to them, they will only respond to those who do reach out to them. And it's oftentimes interests that reach out to him instead of individuals. So it is incumbent on us, uh, whether it's through joining advocacy groups, through communicating, um, with Manotos and Manotos through reading on what we're doing and remaining educated that we can impact change. And uh, that's a fantastic story. I didn't know uh, that detail about how Senator Bob Menendez became a philhelene. <laughs> it's fantastic. No, I should mention on that about getting involved because this is again a perfect example of how the American Atlantic Council gets it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, far too few people, too few people um, not only in our community, but Americans don't understand how the process works. Um, if you're a member of Congress, uh, you get on average 5,000 written communications a week. If you're a senator, you get an average of 25,000 written communications a week. So the old write a letter to your senator, send an email, they literally bounce off a brick wall. If we got in one day 15 constituents, not just Greek Americans, but a constituent to email the member of Congress and say, we want you to do this for Greece for Cyprus. What these offices do is they come in and they report, not to the member, but the chief of staff say, okay, today we got um, 387 emails on health care, you know, 450 on the president's bill on this, you know, they, oh, and, and, and I would imagine a lot of offices, they don't even report subject matters that are below 100 or below 50. So, and that's a hard thing to do to get 15 different people in one day to email. And I, and this is where uh, the Hellenic American Leadership Council has done a good job in, in making it easier for people to engage online and trying to up those numbers. But that's one day. And then the next day goes by. If zero come the next day, they say, well, how important is this issue to us? So the way you engage senators and members of Congress, unfortunately, it's a very expensive way to do it, but it's through raising money or contributing. Um, the average, the amount of money that a member of Congress has to raise to get reelected or get elected and then reelected is phenomenal, over a million dollars, even if they've got a safe seat, because everybody's so worried about these self financers coming at the last minute, they need to raise a lot of money to scare them off. So even if they've got no one on the ballot running against them, they're still trying to raise over a million dollars. Well, do the math. You got two years to raise a million dollars. You got only so many work days in, in the year, you're going to be raising tens or not hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. It's insane. So if you walk in and say, listen, we would like to try to help relieve you of that burden, and we'd like to raise some money, and we'd like you to sit down and talk with these leaders, most policymakers are up for that. Um, and that is the way to get their attention. It's expensive. These things, you know, the, the least amount of money to get at a table like that with a policymaker is maybe 250 more likely 500 dollars. Um, it's expensive. A lot of people don't understand the value of that. Um, so that's how they get to hear you out. Now, let me make something crystal, crystal clear. If that policymaker, I go and I write a check, I sit down and we raise some money for him. If you go back to him and say, look, we'd like you to do A, B, and C. If A, B, and C, that policymaker doesn't think is what's best for their constituents or what's best for the country, they'll say, look, I'm sorry, I can't do that. 
And if that person would have said, well, I gave you this much money, he'd say, well, take your money back. I, first of all, I don't need it. I got to raise a million dollars. It's nice of you to give me $500. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a way of, of getting their ear and getting their focus and in in, in one-to-one. And so what we have done in Washington and throughout the communities in, in New York and L.A. is done these kinds of fundraisers, particularly in the districts. Those are even more valuable. Um, and uh, what a lot of people in our community don't understand is they think, well, the reason that Senator member is going to support our issues is because we're on the side of justice and there's illegal Turkish invasion and occupation and, and the, you know, Greece needs our help financially. And, and the, the logic of your issue does not win the day, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. It's access and it's relationships. And the way you develop relationships is by contributing and raising money. And then they get to know you and then they get to see how they can help you. And then you can better help them understand, look, a huge number of the people who are helping you get elected think this is important. And, and so that's, that's how it all works. American Atlantic Council understands that you guys do fundraisers for your local officials. When, when you've got honorees come out to be honored at your, uh, your gala, you'll do fundraisers for them. Um, it's an important part of this process and just so few organizations and individuals in our community understand that that's how it works. Um, it's, it's a strange thing where you can go with someone in our community to a, a restaurant and there'll be 10 people there and there's a fist fight on who gets to pay for the, you know, $1,500 check. You go to that same person and say, could you come to this event and $250 for this member of Congress? Ah, you know, I'm busy. I can't do it. It just, it just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive, <laughs> but unfortunately it's, it's far too often the case. So again, thank you to all that you the American Atlantic Council does, Mike Galanakis, Eris Anagnos for so many decades, and our other friends, Minas Cafatos, and your, your current president who we worked with when he was with the HEPA, and, and now American Atlantic Council, um, get it, and, and are doing their part to engage these important policymakers who can really make a difference uh, with regards to the, the issues of concern to Greece and Cyprus and the Greek American community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, um... Where are we, do you know, in the development of the center, which is going to be part of this Eastern Med uh, Act? It's going to be in D.C. Do, do we know anything about the center? Um, I haven't seen um, a lot of specifics on that. I think, um, as is the case a lot of times with this legislation, they're you know, advocating these kinds of things to get people thinking more about it. I think that's <laughs> going to be a lot that's going to be left up to you know, possibly the next administration. I think it, it, while the while the legislation passed, it was it was a huge victory. Us, that we certainly all of a sudden got consumed in in the, in the, the pandemic, and a lot of yes. these things have been put on hold. Um, so I haven't heard the latest on that, but I do think at least it's a foot in the door, as they say, something that we can build upon. 